points I will make on why virtual courts cannot uh, replace. We cannot have virtual courts for all matters and certainly not the very vast majority of matters which are argued in the Supreme Court. This is why I say that. One is because you see, I mean, we are advocates. We are counsel. The, when there is a complex argument, whether it's a constitutional case or any matter which requires some kind of persuasion, I don't think you can completely substitute the physical presence. There is something about the intimacy of a courtroom. And I think that, you know, the power of persuasion uh, cannot be uh, uh, it, it cannot be substituted in a virtual environment. You will lose a lot in that process. I believe. Uh, I mean, I, I feel that. Way. Mm. So therefore, in 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 when the when the uh, the tool of the trade is persuasion, that cannot be substituted in an impersonal. There is a certain impersonal quality to a virtual hearing, and I don't think it can completely be replicated. Uh, two is, you know, when we talk, because it's been in the news how, you know, some lawyers both in India and uh, overseas have appeared in their inner wear and, and, and so on. And that's making some sort of amusing news. But um, I think it, it, it makes a very serious point, which is that, you know, there is something about a courtroom. The fact that you are present in a courtroom, um, the, the courtroom is designed and structured in a particular way, and that is meant to convey something. The, oh. the chairs are put in a particular uh, a way, that there is a bar, there is a bench, and all of that. There is an emblem behind you. Um, that is meant to really, it's symbolic of the rule of law, and it is meant to inspire some kind of awe, some, you know, an aura which it is conveying in you. Some people would call it the majesty of the court or whatever, but it does convey that public confidence and that public awe of the rule of law and of the court system. First and foremost, once you agree on a particular, you know, sort of sense of what you really want to do, do you want to have, uh, you know, uh, sort of virtual courts for a particular type of matter? Do you want to bring it in, uh, you, the, you know, the use of technology as a hybrid system? someone needs to decide upon that the problem that we are facing today is a lot of ad hocism that which system should i use should i use zoom should i use this so so i think we're just clearing uh, the, the mess currently as i see it technology is is an aid technology is something that we, we need to use in, in, a, in a particular manner. And the problem is that there is absolutely no, you know, formal uh, introduction of the use of technology, either in our law school or even, even outside as, as, as a practitioner. And I think that is uh, really the, the, the cause. That's why you know, people are sort of, uh, you know, struggling even at this, uh, this, this particular point of time when, uh, you know, they have no option but to use technology. I think uh, it's also about not um, introducing a concept as a threat because the moment we keep saying now everything is going to become technology driven, it is bound to happen like you said, um, you gave us an example, people who, um, like, you know, who who somehow start feeling threatened that oh it's going to replace something that I am capable of doing and it's not my zone of comfort. They are going to take pride in not being uh, tech savvy. They are going to take pride in saying, oh, I'm ignorant, right? Every district therefore uh, has uh, the potential for uh, video conferencing to take place where locally it should be possible for some person to do it. But then somehow at the district center, they never believed that it is possible for one department to help another. He would probably be thinking that his commitment is to the particular portfolio judge he has to report, that he has to do some work across to another institution. You think it is not possible. So therefore, there is a reluctance amongst uh, in the judiciary, where you have several branches uh, there with that, or you have the tribunals, you have other persons, they don't believe that their loyalty must go to any other place beyond their own limited area. 
you know, if it, they're attached to high court, they have, they come under the supervisory jurisdiction of the high court. And they think it is to that high court that they must answer. Now, it is to that particular judge that, that they must answer. Now, having said that, I know NIC is important, e-committees are important. A very important role for sensitization and training is uh, also uh, you know, uh, rendered by the state legal services committees and the academies to train lawyers and to train uh, you know, the judicial officers. And I've myself been fortunate for the last two decades, been training police officers, judicial officers across India. It really has impacted uh, uh, to a great degree because National Police Academy, National Judicial Academy, State Academies are all doing regular consistent programs on training them on technology and adapting you know, to the, the needs of technology and how we can use this in our judicial systems. So I would say that I think the better thing to do is to set in place a pilot project my only experience by and large, uh, to some extent with the Bombay High Court and then the Supreme Court, so that is the limited nature of my experience. So I can talk a little bit about how we can, you know, use technology in the Supreme Court. So I think we are looking at three stages. One is the immediate, which is the unusual, uh, uh, and, and hopefully that will not last very long. That's the immediate in which we are compelled to, to, to uh, function through virtual courts. Uh, the second will be, and I think we can do more even now, we can, you know, have more uh, matters listed, people willing to, you know, uh, SLP admissions, you know, fresh matters which haven't been heard, those can certainly be, if, if, if people are willing, they can, uh, 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 um, you know, we can have more matters, we should have more matters listed. Uh, the second is the uh, short term, I would say the medium term. Uh, where there may be a partial lifting of the lockdown, but we certainly cannot afford any form of crowding. And the third is, of course, the long term, where we find that despite judges and lawyers working very hard in the Supreme Court, it's not really amounting to the kind of efficiency I think our system deserves. We must first look at the areas where we can surely identify physical presence of the lawyer is not necessary. It's not merely an issue of convenience of what Madhavi was saying, uh, such as when custody issue or where the, on account of distance a person can't come. Beyond that, I'm looking at certain classes of cases, which by the very nature of things do not require any elaborate oral evidence at all. All the data, what you collect, it should be possible for you to put them through and then secure answers. I'm not even talking about artificial intelligence, the only way, no, but preparing a module through which module you'll be able to secure answers. And for that, again, to make other people accept that it is great value which is available. Therefore, what you do is uh, you show to the, the whole of the other people the results of what the, this is going to achieve. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, we discard that. So uh, identify subjects, uh, particular genres, and then identify areas where it can be experimented, then come back with results. And depending on the kind of outcomes that we have experienced where they are good, they should be applied elsewhere.